This is the bandoneon. Um, and you might know the bandoneon from the famous Astor Piazzolla, who is probably one of the most well-known global proponents of the instrument. Um, but unlike Phil's quite expansive journey through the accordion across Europe, the bandoneon is really, these days, only really found in Buenos Aires in Argentina. Um, at least that's where the tango kind of comes from, and Montevideo in Uruguay. And even throughout the other regions of Argentina, the accordions played in different dance formats and, and different things. But really, the bandoneon, its home is Buenos Aires in Argentina. Um, but I thought I'd give you a bit of a sense of the sound and play a couple of very short pieces from Piazzolla um, and introduce you to the sound. <laughs> And we're going to play uh, quite a lot of piazzolla tonight, but also some traditional tango and some more modern stuff. Um, but for those of you who know a bit about Piet piazzolla, he was writing a lot of kind of classical music, some traditional tango, started off a bit of a jazz tango thing, but also wrote a, wrote a lot of film scores, um, operas, ballets, that kind of thing. So this is a tune from one of his film scores called Los Sueños. <laughs> And so the bandoneon um, was actually 
invented in Germany in kind of the mid 19th century as a portable church organ really for the kind of up in the hills of Germany, but quickly found its way with the mass migration that was happening to Argentina at the turn of the 20th century. And I think it, it kind of arrived in Brazil with some German sailors originally, but then found its way into um, around Buenos Aires in the ports of Montevideo as well. Um, and quickly found its way into the brothels and all the kind of the promiscuous nightlife of the port area um, where the tango was starting to um, find its place in Buenos Aires. Um, but it's quite different to the accordion, so they're all buttons. But the other really interesting thing about the bandoneon is it's by oracle, so all the buttons change whether you're pushing in or out. And quite randomly as well, the system... I don't know who invented this thing, but... <laughs> um, but I'm going to be joined by Amy Lynch here on the piano. And Amy is another very proficient bandoneon player and accordion player. And I think the last time we played here was with the Melbourne Tango Orchestra, which is a, a kind of a 10-piece traditional style dance orchestra. Um, and we've got three of these, which is very exciting. This is another piece by Astor Piazzolla. <laughs> Thank you. 
And so the tango in Argentina really had its heyday in kind of the 1930s, 1920s, when the big tango bands, um, you know, they were playing every night. You had the big dance halls filled every night and dance was really popular. Um, and so the band leaders that ran these different bands um, became kind of the superstars of the day, the idols. Um, and one of those was called Salgan. And Salgan, unlike traditionally in Argentina, you don't associate the Afro-Argentinian heritage um, much with tango, but Salgan really brought those roots back into the music and some of the earlier musical traditions from that Afro-Cuban, uh, Afro-Argentinian history. Um, but his band was really famous for that. But a lot of the band leaders would also pay their homage to past tango um, greats, and particularly those who wrote a lot of famous tangos. And so this tune was written by this band leader, Salgan, um, but in homage of Agustin Bardi. So this is called Don Agustin Bardi. And we're just having a discussion out the back, actually, with Paul, who just played. Um, and we're talking about 
you know, does tango have any kind of percussion instruments in it and that kind of thing? And we were thinking a lot of popular dance styles, particularly from that era and in Latin America, have percussive instruments. But tango is kind of a bit of an anomaly in that because it doesn't have percussive instruments. Um, but maybe you'll hear in the bandoneon and also if you hear tango string players, violinists, it has a very percussive style to it um, and it kind of compensates for that lack of um, traditional percussion instruments. And so you might hear me bashing on this quite a fair bit because that's kind of the style. But another, um, a bit of a very interesting thing about tango is the final two cad the final cadence of each piece um, always goes loud, soft, and it kind of throws you a little bit. So every piece kind of finishes. Let's go. It's very nice. But we're actually going to take a quick detour to um, France because we were thinking the bandoneon's quite a versatile instrument as well. And, and if you ever meet some bandoneon players, even in Buenos Aires, um, they'll be studying Bach and they study a lot of classical music as well to kind of get their fingers around the instrument. There's this really gorgeous vocalese written by Ravel, the classical music composer, um, but he used the habanera rhythm as the kind of fundamental metre of this piece, and so, so he thought it would be a nice meeting of worlds to play this one. It also occurred to me, as we are listening to Phil, you know, how many dance styles are associated with these kind of squeeze boxes, how much, um, you know, association there is between 
this instrument and, and creating those kind of dance rhythms. And so the tango um, developed alongside the music and you have the traditional tango dance, but you also have these other styles of dance that happen within the same context. And one is the tango valse. Um, and there's another milonga, which Phil played one earlier. Um, but we're going to do a tango valse. So it's very similar to what you would expect from a, a kind of waltz, but with a bit of tango edge. Coming back to some uh, Piazzolla, um, and I don't know if anyone knew that I think last year was his centenary since his birth, or maybe the year before. Yeah, and we're all getting very excited because we're going to be doing all these Piazzolla gigs and things, but of course that all got delayed or waylaid, and so we thought we'd put in plenty of Piazzolla tonight. Um, and Piazzolla had a particular love hate relationship for Buenos Aires, all the kind of really conservative, traditional. Tangueros really pushed him aside and said, you're not playing real tango, what, what you do is not tango. But he was really trying to push the envelope. But he loved the city, he wrote a lot of pieces um, which incorporated 
kind of sound effects and really tried to paint the soundscape of Buenos Aires, this big bustling city, the city that never sleeps. Um, and so this tango is called street tango, so kind of in homage to some of the street sounds of Buenos Aires. I'm going to do a, another quick solo 
bandonian piece, and this is again by Piazzolla. Um, bandonian players like to play a lot of Piazzolla because he was kind of quite a virtuosic musician, but he also wrote a lot of arrangements for solo bandonian. Um, and you'll notice quite a difference between the kind of solo works. They're much slower, much more kind of legato, much more melodic um, compared to some of the ensemble stuff, which is much more about dancing. It's much more rhythmic. Um, but this is a very traditional tango written in the early 20th century called Loca Bohemia, which is kind of talking about this crazy bohemian world that is Buenos Aires. Um, but you'll hear a lot of the musical language that Piazzolla used in his arrangements was influenced from jazz, classical, and a whole range of different soundscapes. <laughs> I won't introduce this one because I'm sure it might be familiar to most of your ears. But I will say that um, Piazzolla also had a very uh, strong interest in the other, rhythm, other rhythms from Argentina. And so this is um, a milonga campera. So it's a very slow, kind of beautiful rhythm from the countryside. <laughs> 